Good morning, pre-Cal students. I hope everybody's doing okay. Uh, we had a lot of uh, new, or I guess, new ideas with identities uh, with the last class, and, and we found them to be relatively useful in that they're helping us to expand uh, what we know about the trig functions and how we can combine them. So first, uh, today, uh, we want to talk about some trig equations, but I wanted to take an opportunity to do a, a couple of examples from these sections. Really, when it comes to section two and three, it's basically just immersing yourself in these new identities, writing them down, getting used to them uh, so that they become more familiar. And, and the good thing about this is that as you practice these identities, the old ones will be even that much easier. So what I wanted to do is share my screen and do just you know a couple of examples that utilize some of the new identities. So let's go go with that. Let's see here. Let me find the IPVO. Here we go. Now, what I was talking about, at least in terms of what I thought to be interesting equations or problems uh, is based on uh, the kind of uh, questions I was getting during my conference hours. And one that was very popular was combining uh, a sine and a cosine function. So here we have three sine of pi x minus three square root three cosine pi x. And these, these came up uh, frequently. Now remember, we have that lemma, which allows us to combine the two functions, the sine and the cosine, into one, so we can apply graphing techniques if necessary. So this is very useful in, in other classes, even outside of mathematics, which, well, that's nothing new. So we have uh, the lemma a sine x plus b cosine x equals the square root of a squared plus b squared times sine of x plus phi, where phi is defined by its tangent. That is, the tangent of phi is b over a. So this is a very useful way of, again, combining a couple of trig functions into a format that may be of more use to you as opposed to this. So again, it's restrictive, but still it has its merits. So now we can just compare from the model, just like the identities we work with all the time. We have A is equal to three, and we have B is equal to the negative three times the square root of three. So first, let's just go ahead and look at what uh, uh, tangent of phi is. So tangent of phi will be b over a, so we get negative three, square root three, divided by three, which is the negative square root of three. Now this is something we know about, this is on the unit circle. So phi will be the inverse tangent of the additive inverse of square root of three, but of course the inverse tangent is, is odd, so we can factor the negative. And we know this is gonna live in the uh, fourth quadrant. And we're not required to move it around into the positive. Sometimes we'll find that we need to do that, especially with solving equations. So now of course we think of the inverse tangent of root three, which is the, the sine is root three over two, the cosine is, is one half, so that gives us a uh, pi over three. So this will be a negative pi over three. Now, that's the, that's the easy part, at least in terms of the inverse trig function, since we uh, spent so much time on those. Uh, I want you to actually know what an inverse trig function is. I've, I've used a lot, utilized it with the law of sines and law of cosines, hopefully to, to embed that concept in your, in your brains. And so now all we have to do is just square things. So a squared plus b squared 
that'll give us a three squared. And of course, if we square here, we get another three squared uh, times a three. So squaring the negative uh, three gives us three squared and squaring the radical just gives us three. So this is nine times one plus three, which is what, nine times four or 36. So now when we write this, using this, we could fill everything in. So this will be equals, let me move this down a little bit. There we go, bring this down a little bit more, makes it a little bit larger. So now we just replace here the square root of 36. And then we have sine and fill this in. The x now has been replaced with pi x. And then we have uh, minus pi over three for the phi. And so if you want, you can factor this. Well, this will just be six sine. I mean, this is fine. Webassign would like this. We can factor the pi and just have x minus one third. So right now, again, this is more or less an academic exercise, but, but one that you'll find of utility. And so when you look at this, it just basically reminds you of a, of the transformations that we did when we graphed, you know, of course, now the K is uh, pi. So the new period is going to be two pi divided by pi, which is two. And then we have a uh, right shift by one third in a vertical stretch by six. So you can see that the combination of these two functions to give you this would allow for utilization of our uh, transformation techniques. So, so that in and of itself is a, a good reason to be familiar with this. Now, what I want to do, again, as I've, I've told you before, all of the concepts that we've used working with inverse trig functions, all of the techniques that we've had before will still apply to the new identities. And so none of that, none of that will change. Now, what I want to do is look at a power reducing identity. But before I do that, there's one example that I wanna cover Oh, every time I hit this, I have to worry about my, let's see, let me get this back up. Magic computers. I move my mouse and then it, and it, then I use my Wacom tablet and it, it has a mind of its own. So before I do this uh, power reducing, I want to say something about um, just using a new subtraction formula. And this again was popular during the conference hours. So for instance, here we have, we want to compute cosine of theta minus phi, okay? So, so you can see that's a subtraction formula or a difference formula. And what are we told? Well, we're told that cosine of theta is five over 13. So that's the legitimate value of cosine. And then the theta terminates in the fourth quadrant. So again, X is positive here, Y is negative. So the same arithmetic as before. And then what do we know about phi? Well, we have tangent of phi is the negative square root of three. And phi terminates in the second quadrant. So X is negative and Y is positive. So, so again, the arithmetic is the same. And so what we can do, since now we have triangles, we can draw first quadrant reference triangles and then attach the appropriate sign uh, based upon the arithmetic of the quadrant. So here we have a theta and we can do uh, adjacent over hypotenuse. And now, of course, this is a nice Pythagorean triple. If we square the 13, we get 169. And if we square the five, we get a 25. So we can look at the difference here. That'll give us two fours and a one. But of course, that's 12 squared. So this, this side would just be uh, 12. And so now here, the reference triangle for five 
you can do if you want you can put a little hat there but that that's just extra notation that may confuse you so even though we're looking at the reference triangle the idea is that we get the right sign by referring to the arithmetic of the quadrant so this is actually a better technique and it doesn't require you to draw forever so now here we have opposite over adjacent so we have square root of three over one and now we can just square this out one squared uh, plus the square root of three squared that's three so that equals four square root of four is two so we get a nice simple triangle there so now let's write what this is this was the one of the second formulas we proved last class so this is cosine of theta cosine of phi and now of course the minus here we get the plus plus sine theta sine phi so that's our difference formula or subtraction formula so now we just fill it in so cosine theta we've been given we have 5 over 13 and then cosine of phi again we go over here we know that the x is negative so this will be a negative value so cosine will be 1 over 2 with the negative so again you draw your reference triangle, but you pay attention to the arithmetic of the quadrant. And then we have plus sine theta. So we go to the uh, sign here, but notice the y is negative. So that's going to be a negative value. So we have uh, opposite over hypotenuse. So we get negative 12 over 13. And then sine phi, again, here the y is positive. So this will be a positive quantity. So we have opposite over hypotenuse well we kind of know what that triangle is it looks very familiar so now this would be an exact value of course WebAssign probably wouldn't mind this but we can go ahead and uh, these are all uh, for instance we can reduce these or just leave the same denominator as uh, 13 times 2 since we've got a nice common denominator so we get a negative 5 minus a 12 root 3 so of course you could factor the negative and this gives you five plus 12 root three divided by 26. So very simple problem, but it utilizes all of the arithmetic that we've been doing uh, from day one. So, so these, are, these problems actually make you better at trig. Uh, but again, you have to embrace the new identities and commit these addition and subtraction formulas to memory. Uh, they are the building blocks for all of the other ones, and you can always kind of revive yourself if you know those. Okay. So now what I want to do is a power reducing example. When you get the Cal 1, you do utilize some aspects of power reducing, but not as much. You're probably more interested in just the basic trig identities. When you do the differential and integral calculus of the trig functions, but when you get uh, to Cal 2, you're going to focus on more of the higher powers of sine and cosine, and you're going to figure out that they're uh, uh, calculus is complementary in the sense that, that they have very nice um, uh, derivatives that repeat that are cyclical, unlike the tangent function, which is kind of a nightmare. So, so we want to capitalize on that. So here's an example. Now, when you take calculus, you're also going to learn about reduction formulas for powers of sine and cosine or all six trig functions, which would also be a route uh, around this type of problem that we're going to do. But what we want to do is write, write in terms, I'll tell you what it is, write in terms of the first powers of cosine. This is good to know. And once you do it once, you'll never forget it. Now, the, the idea is we want to use a power reducing formula. So we had the cosine squared of the argument A was going to be one plus cosine two A, the double angle. 
divided by two. So this is what we call the power reducing formula. And then I'm gonna remind you, I'm gonna use another use of A, but it'll be easy in the binomial. For the very first week, we'll do the binomial theorem in general uh, at the end of the course. That's the very last thing we do um, after we learn about math induction. And, and this was one of the formulas that you had the very first day. And this is A cubed plus three A squared B plus three A B squared plus B cubed. So that would be a way to expand um, something raised to a third power. And here's the, here's the expression. Of course, with, with calculus, you'll have differentials. So we'll just go ahead and do cosine of X raised to the sixth power. So if we say cosine squared, we mean cosine of A quantity squared. Here we've got cosine of X raised to the sixth power. Now, the idea is that if we use this reduction formula, then we can reduce the powers and then frequent application of this will cut down all the powers to a first degree. Notice cosine of the double angle is degree one. It's just the power of that is one. So, so we could have products of power one, but I'm gonna show you a way to even get rid of those using another identity we learned. So what I want to do here is use this, but before I do it, I've got to do a little algebra here. What is this equal? Well, this is just cosine squared X to the third power. We'll just use the laws of exponents. So if we cube the square of the cosine, that'll give us the sixth power of the cosine. But now we're thinking, how are we gonna use this? Well, now for here, we substitute this. So this will give us one plus cosine two X. Remember we double the angle divided by two to the third power. I really did want to go over this. The other, the other examples pale in comparison. This is, this is difficult. Uh, Cal two students struggle with this. So that's why I like the Stewart text because it gets you accustomed to this before you get beaten down with it when you get to Cal uh, two. And you don't want to do this the first time in Cal two. It's too difficult to have to start over. So now when we look at this, we've got like an A and a B here, and then this two, we can just cube it and get rid of it. That'll just be an eight downstairs that we'll just move to the side and get it out of our uh, way. So this would be one eighth. And now if you like, write this down. A for this formula is one and B is cosine two X. So this is gonna help us when we get to the binomial theorem. I do actually think about what I teach you. And because I'm basically an expert in analysis, I know the calculus sequence. So whatever I'm teaching you in this class, you need to know this is not for your amusement or mine. Uh, this is gonna help you uh, do well in calculus, uh, but it will not be easy. So cube one, well, we like that. That's just one plus three. Again, we cube one, that's one times B. So that's a cosine two X plus three. We love the ones, three times one is just three and B squared gives us cosine squared two X. So we square the B and then the very last one is just cosine cubed two X. So A cubed three times A squared times B, three times A B squared and then B squared. So now we look at that and say that's this one here, that's a first power. So this, these get checks, these are good. We don't have to do any more to these. We may, we may end up with more of these terms, but these are done, these are first powers. This is a square, so we need to use this again. And then this is a square times a singleton or unit uh, power. And so we get to use this again. So let's do it. Now the reduction formulas that you learn with integration by parts would avoid using this, but students at that time have to decide do they want power reducing or do they wanna use the reduction formula? It's a choice that you have to make. 
and then your antiderivatives will look different. So they're, they're, they're checks and balances, so to speak. So we have one plus three cosine two X plus now we have a three, but of course this is gonna be another application of this. So we're gonna have a two. So let's go ahead and factor the two. I'll bring this down a little bit so you can see it. So now this will be one plus, now we double the two, we get the four, one plus cosine four X. So again, we have the one plus cosine four X divided by two, and I just bring the two out here with the three. Okay, so that's done. Now here, when we look at this, let's just do a little sidebar for this one. This equals cosine two X times cosine squared two X, right? So that's again, what we just did in the previous one. So that's a first power, but that's a second power. So we need to apply this again. So this will be uh, cosine two X. And then of course times, well, we're gonna have the, the one half. So we'll just pull it out. And this will give us uh, one plus cosine four X. So when you look, when you look at this, at this point, you're thinking, well, it looks like we're done. We just have first powers here. So let's just multiply it out and collect everything. Now, first, what I'm going to notice here is that I've got a one half here. I've got to multiply the cosine two X times the one and the cosine four X, but I've got all these two. So let's get rid of that first. So bring out the two, that'll give us a one over 16 and then pay for it. These don't have two, so that becomes a two plus a six cosine two X, hit that with a two. Well, the two was relieved of us, so we get what plus three plus three cosine four X. And here, we just go ahead and multiply that out. That two is gone, so we get what cosine two X plus cosine two X times cosine four X. Okay, so now these are all first powers and WebAssign likes this. So now what do we get? Well, we have one over 16. We can combine some things. We have a two and a three, that's a five. And then for the two X's, we've got a six copies here and one copy here. So that'll be seven cosine two X. So those are gone. And then we've got one copy of the fourth, uh, the multiple angle four X, so to speak. So it will three of them, three cosine four X. And then we have this guy down here, the product of the single powers, but different arguments. Now, WebAssign would be very happy with this answer here. Why? Because all the powers of the cosine are first power. This is a product. And so you're thinking, why is this an improvement, Professor Ron? Well, that's an easy antiderivative. They call them indefinite integrals. That's easy, that's easy, but that isn't. That would either require, that would require a, a product to some formula, okay? But, but it's doable. Okay, that'll use one of the identities we've already talked about. So let's just say we're, we're doing this problem in calculus too, and we're thinking, man, this is more trig than it is calculus. Well, welcome to calculus. <clears throat> you will do more algebra and trigonometry in executing the calculus than, than you would probably want to admit uh, or know at this time. Well, I'm here to tell you, you do a lot of this. Now, this, this, this right here, fine. I wanna give you one additional ingredient. Remember yesterday we had the uh, cosine A times cosine B. Now, let me show you, I, I kept all of my notes. You're thinking Professor Ron doesn't throw anything away. So <clears throat> we've got our nice little product to sum here. Now you can remember these 
<clears throat> or you can have them ready on your card. So we have one half cosine A plus B plus cosine A minus B. So let's write that down. Plus cosine A minus B. So these aren't hard to remember, but when you're, when you're busy writing a test, it's nice to have the reference. You can always derive them, but, but when you're trying to save a little bit of computational time, this is good. So now what we can see here, we can have the, do an assignment, A equals 2X here and B equals 4X, your choice, it doesn't really matter. So now we can fill that in. So this will be one over 16, five plus seven cosine two X plus three cosine four X. And now we'll just do the one half. And so we'll have uh, multiply these out plus one half cosine. So A plus B, that'll be six X and then plus one half, and then A minus B. But remember, that'll give us a negative two X, but the cosine is even, so the negative absorbs. So that just gives us a cosine two X. So the product to sum gives us two simpler ones. And now we've got more twos in, so let's get rid of the twos, factor out the twos downstairs. So this will be one over 32. So hit that with a two, 10 plus 14, cosine 2x plus 6 cosine 4x plus cosine 6x plus cosine 2x. Now let's just combine everything. Uh, what do we have left? We've got a 10. Now we've got an extra copy of this, so that gives us 15 cosine 2x's. And then we have the, these remaining ones, six cosine 4X plus cosine 6X. Now, the thing is, and this is where I tell my students, do you wanna use the reduction formula, integral formula from the integral table, or do you wanna do all of this? And most of them say, once you get to like a six power, that reduction formula is, is a little bit easier to use. So you're thinking, man, this is, this is a lot of work. It's a lot of work to do the integral antiderivative of this, because the idea is that now these are all doable antiderivatives. These are just first powers of cosine. You can knock those off in no problem. I mean, this, this integral would be simple at this point, because now what you're gonna learn is that the antiderivative of cosine u du is just sine u plus an arbitrary constant. So all of these integrals are just sines. That'll have a one six, that'll have a uh, uh, one over 24, that'll have a one over 30 a coefficient. That'll just be a 10 X all times one over 32. So you could, you could do these integrals in your head, but you can't do that one in your head you have to reduce the higher power. And that's why we have reduction formulas and integral tables that do the reduction for us. And we just reapply and reapply and reapply. And then when we're done, the integral's done. Here, we have to do the reduction and then integrate, but the integral's so simple, it probably, if you, if you get efficient at one, you'll do it fine. So, so the idea here is that as you take your engineering and physics classes, your professors may say, okay, well, you can use your integral table or you can use your computer algebra system. But, but in the calculus class, you have to be able to do this. And that's where I stay you know, vigilant about my calculus students that they're not just using online computer algebra systems and missing this. Uh, that of course is unfortunate and, and will spell your demise. Uh, so do not be tempted to to use the online integrating uh, systems uh, that do all the work for you, uh, you will never learn anything and you won't make it into the STEM career. So, so be sure you learn all of this and then as your professors allow you to use technology, use it, use it to check your work.
that's a good tool. That's like we have our Google calculator to get a nice calculus approximation after we do exact computation. So this, this, is, this is now why you see the reduction formula is of importance to us. So this is a technique you should practice and you'll get some practice with this uh, with your web assign. Just remember, these are all first powers here. So if you stopped at this point, web assign would give you the, I don't have a green here, it'd give you the green check, so to speak. But I just thought I'd go ahead and use this formula from last class to make it even easier. So you have options. Uh, again, there is no one way to do any problem. There are many ways. And so I just wanna introduce you to a technique that does come up in your Calculus 2 course when you take the calculus sequence. So that's a fun problem and a very doable problem. Now, let's see, I've got another example here that I wanna do before I start with the equations. Let me look through these and make sure we get one that it will be of use. Oh yeah. I wanted to do one with the inverse trig, and also I wanted to do one, ladies and gentlemen, with the half angle. That was another problem that, that came up in the conference hours, and I think this would be interesting. So just to give you some practice with the half angle. So compute sine of x over two. For instance, I was telling the students at the time that you can use your new identity to get the ball rolling. It's like we use the law of cosines if we have side angle side, and then we can use the law of sines. You have the problem where you have the polygon that you break up into two triangles, where you can use the standard one half AB sine theta, and then use the law of cosines to get that third side, which will allow you to get the angle. And of course, that's a lot of exact computation. But there's no one way to do it. Some students I recommended using Heron's formula. But again, you have to be careful with your decimals and write everything in exact computation. If you run into problem with round off error, then that means you haven't been paying attention to me. So, so be careful, be careful. This is important as future engineers, computer scientists, mathematicians, you need to be able to compute exactly so that you can convince your colleagues that your results are valid. Now. We want to produce all of these values in the quickest possible way. And what's the, what's the given? Well, we're told that cosine of x, we're not given much, is negative 15 over 17. Okay, and then of course, if we're thinking uh, inverse uh, cosine, this would, this would actually be in the second quadrant and they give us that. Or, or the third quadrant. Well, if inverse cosine, it would be in the second quadrant because we know we run from zero to 180 or zero to pi, but they switch it up just a little bit. They go ahead and move this into the third quadrant. So they, they make it a little bit more difficult. So X actually lives in the third quadrant. So they, they throw a little uh, curveball here. Now, remember, we only need to use one of the half angle formulas here. So after, once we have this, these are easy consequences of just the simple theorems that we already know. So we don't have to keep reusing new formulas that may be difficult. So now first we know from our last lecture, we got these nice half angle, though they weren't very elegant. We had the pluses and minus. So we had sine of X over two of the half angle is plus or minus the square root of one minus cosine X divided by two. So this was not a very user-friendly answer. We got a very nice one for tangent without the plus or minus, but that was, that was a, the remarkable formula, so to speak. So we determined the sign here by determining the quadrant of X over two. So we can use this hypothesis here. So let's divide everything by two. This was a good example. Like I said, this was from the conference hours and I thought this would be good for, for everyone to see. So this will give us 90 degrees. So this is gonna push everything into the second quadrant. And then of course, this will give us a one and then a three and then a five. So now X over two is in the second quadrant. Okay, 
So what does that say? Well, in the second quadrant, X is negative. Well, that's good. You know, that's still still good, still good. You know, everything's fine. And then Y is positive. So the sine function will be positive there. So, so the, the interesting part about these problems is that when, when you set them up, they have to be consistent. For instance, you know you have a, a, a messed up problem when, when you do the arithmetic and then the, there's an inconsistency. So th this is a nice way, again, to verify, you know, when, when Dr. Stewart comes up with problems or I come with, up with problems, I have to make sure that they're consistent so that as you make the efforts to solve them in the deductive reasoning, that everything uh, meshes well. So now that means we're going to take the uh, positive uh, for the sign. But, but the, the key here is we just want to use this formula in the squared. Forget the radicals for now. So sine squared, just giving you some, some good techniques to make your work easier. The square will just be 1 minus negative 15 over 17 divided by 2. So we'll just get a common denominator of 17. So you can go ahead and bring it downstairs if you want to times 17, and then this will give us a 17 plus uh, a 15 minus minus. So now this will give us what? That gives us a 12, a 32, 2 times 17. And of course, this will reduce. And, and what's interesting about this is that 2 into 32 is 16, and that's just a perfect square. So Working with the square first now allows you to square root things. We often work with the square of Euclidean distance to simplify our work. So now this implies choosing the positive sine of x over two is now the principal square root of this, which will be four over root 17. Okay, no, no rationalizing required. Just remember if it doesn't, that's a number and that's correct. Don't do extra work, please. Don't force yourself to do extra work, uh, not, not required. Follow the formatting directions. Hopefully by now you're getting really good at doing that. Now, if we look here, cosine of x over two, let's just use the standard uh, Pythagorean identity. So we'll have cosine squared of x over two will just be one minus sine squared. Well, sine squared is just 16 over 17. So let, let me write this out so you have it in your notes. You know this is true. That's just the fundamental identity. So this is one minus 16 over 17. So once we have that square, we can use it again and then square root things. So again, that'll be 17 minus 16. So let's just write a common denominator, keep everybody on the same page. So this is just one over 17, but now notice the x is negative. So this implies that we take the negative square root. So cosine of x over two of the half angle will now be the negative of one over the square root of 17. So, so again, uh, working with the squares makes the computation easier. And now tangent is just sine over cosine. So we don't have to use a fancy, you don't have to use the half angle formula for tangent. What I'm trying to show you is it's kind of like we were doing the triangles. Get the ball rolling with this and then use the simple relationships that you already know from your previous work to finish the problem because you have better things to do with your time than, than doing extra work. So now this would just be sine over cosine. So here we got what sine, which is four root 17. And then cosine, we just flip it. That'll just be root 17 over negative one because we divide, so invert and multiply. The 17s go, so we just get negative four. So, so the, the work that we're doing here, all of this, this is old, nothing. The only, the only new part was this right here. That was the only new part. Now, what, what's good about this is that it gives us additional arithmetic comp, uh, computational ability. Um, it allows us to add new angles and new terminal points to the unit circle. I mean, we don't really add them. Maybe you can just put them on a note card and say, well, I know this. We know, 
we know uh, cosine of 75 degrees, right? We know we 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 computed that um, uh, for the uh, law of cosine problem. So you know the the idea is that with the new identities, we have even more arithmetic arithmetic uh, results that that make our work a little bit easier. So so this is a good example, but very simple, as you as you see. Now. I just want, again, I want you to be aware of the fact that when we work, uh, again, anything you do with the inverse trig functions and all, um, we, do, we do the same thing that we've done before. There's no difference. So don't, don't look at those and, and start making it up. Uh, just keep everything on the uh, same page. If you, if you have to make a substitution, let alpha be the inverse trig function and flip it around, do that. Um, that's the same operation and use your new uh, addition and subtraction formulas. Do your reference triangles like we've done in the previous examples. And you'll find that you just have, you know, more problems that you can do. That's it. So we expand the identities. So we expand the number of problems that we can do. Now, what I want to do is in our completing of the uh, trig uh, portion of this course, we want to talk about basic equations. So 7.4 and 7.5 will just be trig equations. Now we've already been solving equations. In 6.4, we've already solved equations. And we've solved equations for sine and cosine uh, using the law of sines and the law of, of cosines using Professor Ron's lemma. So, so just to just to kind of remind you of that, remember, uh, we'll just have the very first one here. We have, for instance, sine of x equal b, and we'll just say, for the first case, one, we'll say theta, we'll say solution theta in upper R. solution theta in the upper arc, zero to pi. Then we have second solution is pi minus theta, or 180 minus theta if we're in degrees. Two, solution theta in the lower arc, say from pi to two pi. Second solution, this is Professor Ronslin, we've already talked about this, this will be three pi minus theta. So, so the idea is that we know in the period zero to two pi, that sine function is not one to one, okay? It's not one to one, clearly, we had to restrict it to make it one to one. So if we have a solution in the upper arc, then we can find the second solution by subtracting first solution from pi or 180 degrees. If we have a solution in the lower arc, I'm talking about the unit circle, zero to two pi, so the lower arc, then the second solution is just that subtracted from three pi or 540 degrees. Now, the cosine is the easy one. So if we have like cosine x equal b, this is easy. So we'll say, let me throw a little period there. So solution, solution theta, just in the complete unit circle, again, off the axes, the axial solutions are simple. Those are one or zero. So that, that doesn't require any extra theory. So the second solution is just using the evenness and this will just be two pi minus theta. So the, Professor Ron's lemma for the sine and cosine are here. The sine being more complicated because it depends on you in the upper arc or lower arc. So this gives you an algebraic way of constructing the second solution. I mean, you can think about it visually and a lot of you do thinking about the, the unit circle, but, but maybe the numbers aren't very nice and you have to be able to write down an exact computation. So this is why I felt a need to do this. This was never written in the book. 
And the first time I taught this class uh, at the South Campus, like I say, when I graduated from A&M, I made this my lemma, Professor Ron's lemma, and, and they used it. And I even, like I say, I've got to find that file with the original PDF of that. But, but the beauty of it is that it gives you an algebraic way of, of writing down solutions. So that's kind of like our linchpin here. Now, let's look at a few simple examples here. I've written some easy examples down. So, so you can, just like with the identities, ladies and gentlemen, you can do, you can do equations all day long and then do them till you're tired of them. So let's just look at a simple equation. And you, and again, what do we do when we solve equations? Algebra, algebra, just like we did before we took tree and identities. So a lot of times when we're solving equations, we use algebraic identities, difference of cubes, difference of squares. We do conjugate methods. You know, those identities connected with the algebra help us to use the zero product, right? And then solve equations. Same thing here, nothing different. We just have different identities for trig functions. So here's an example. I made up some and just pulled some from your web assignment, but you're gonna find this to be a whole lot easier than the section on the law of cosines. Everybody's just lamenting that, like that was the hardest section in the world. It wasn't, but, but I think it maybe was just new to most of you. So what we wanna do here is solve, solve, and that means all solutions. If a problem in WebAssign is stated, often they'll just say solve or they'll say find all solutions. Otherwise, they might say find the solutions in a given interval like we did in 6.4, maybe zero to pi or zero to two pi, okay? So always be aware of that. And then they will say approximate when appropriate. And what that means, if you don't have an angle that you know from the unit circle, then you can do a like a two decimal approximation, but only when appropriate. So if you've got angles that you know, then don't start pulling out your calculator and punching around like you don't know what you're doing. Avoid that, you, you'll get the, wrong, get the answer wrong and the problem wrong. So only approximate if we just have unfortunate numbers, like maybe, maybe you need the, uh, the sign of three halves radians. That, that's, not a, that's not a nice number, that's a calculus approximation, but you can always write the exact formula down, uh, but if WebAssign says, in those cases approximate, you do what WebAssign asks. So now when you look at this, you're thinking, well, this is just zero product. So we'll factor the two, we just, it's just first degree. So equivalently, we'll just start with something easy, sine theta, plus one half equals zero. Well, two is never zero, so that means sine theta plus one half must be zero. So this just says sine theta equals negative one half. Well, how simple is this? Let's just like saying two X plus one equals zero. So X is negative one half. Now, we have to use the fact that this is not X or it is an X, but the X is replaced with sine theta. So we use Professor Ron's lemma. Now notice when we look at this, this is negative, this is negative. So, so we're, we know the inverse sine, inverse sine of theta, where does the, or inverse sine, I'll just use X, lives between negative pi over two and pi over two. So this angle's in the fourth quadrant. So now when we do it, we get theta. And so if we're gonna use Professor Ron's lemma, we have to move everything into zero to two pi. That's what I was talking about before. So this will be inverse sine of negative one half. And the sine inverse sine function is odd. So this is the negative of inverse sine of one half. Well, the inverse sine of one half is pi over six made negative, negative pi over six. Now that's in the fourth quadrant. We know that. Well, I, you already, we already knew that. We just verified. But now let's add two pi to put it into the positive realm. So this is congruent. Add two pi, we get 11 pi over six. Again, still in the fourth quadrant. 
So the, the idea here, when we use Professor Ron's lemma, the solution must live in the positive realm, okay? So you can't apply Professor Ron's lemma to something negative because again, it doesn't live here. These are positive intervals. So, so again, you must be careful that you abide by the arithmetic. I say this all the time, students that can't do trig, it's not because they're not smart. They're very smart. They just don't pay attention to the arithmetic of the unit circle. So when you agree that it's correct and abide by it, you'll have much better success. So now, if we look at this, we can get the second solution because now we're in the lower arc here. So we'll just say, we'll call this one theta. We can call the other one alpha, or I don't know, you can call that theta one and theta two, your choice. So we do what? Three pi minus 11 pi over six. So just get a common denominator, 18 pi over six minus 11 pi over six. So that's gonna give us what? That'll give us a seven. Seven copies of pi divided by six. So now we have the first solution right here, solution, and then we have the second solution right here, okay? And so now to get all solutions, so we found all the solutions in zero to two pi. We know the sine function is two pi periodic. So all we do is have to find, this is how we make our life easy. We find all the solutions in one complete period, zero to two pi, and then we just tack on two pi k to get all the solutions, because that will just add on multiples of the period. So now this implies, and, and WebAssign always says separate by commas. You won't have to put these in curly braces, but I am. They'll just ask you to separate by commas, because I always write my solutions that way. So we'll have seven pi over six plus, and they want you to use k for the integer, two pi k, and then we'll say, uh, you can do a union or do just like a comma here. It's your choice. If you just want to, you know, be less writing, you can do this. Now you're thinking you could write these sets separately. This is how you'll write it in WebAssign. You'll put, this, here's the box, and you'll just do this comma the other one. Now, you could also write this as a union. You could say seven pi over six plus two pi k union 11. That's how I write my smart pen videos plus two pi k. That would also be correct, but, but that's a whole lot to do. So when you do, when you do your web assign, you're gonna put this solution here and then your comma, and then your second solution inside the box. That's all you have to do. But, but again, remember these are solution sets, so I'm always gonna use the curly braces and probably just stick to this one since it's more like what you'll be typing in WebAssign, okay? So that's all you have to do. Use some algebra, Professor Ron's lemma. This is the key, this is the key right here. So let's do some more. Now, uh, another question, say maybe, maybe we need a little more algebra to do. So here's another one, solve. I'll just say solve. When I say solve, that means all solutions. So we have four cosine squared theta uh, minus four cosine theta plus a one equals zero. So when you look at this, you're thinking, well, that's just a that's just a perfect square, but maybe maybe you don't notice it. You can think of, of, of this as just being written as two cosine theta quantity squared um, minus two times two cosine theta times a one plus a one squared. That's a perfect square right there. And so this is, this. remember, this looks like this. This is like a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. That just equals a minus b quantity squared. So if you don't recognize that, you can just use Professor Ron's lemma with the AC method or the AC lemma. That works too. 
but that's a that's clearly a perfect square. So this is equivalently a minus b. So we get two cosine theta minus one squared equals zero. So so again, if you don't recognize this, you can do AC. For instance, if you thought, well, AC, you see AC equals four times one. And then of course you need negative four here. So you can just use a negative two and a negative two. So that'll also work. But, but again, if you recognize it, fine. If you don't, you'll get the same answer. Um, that's what I said when we were reviewing this at the beginning of the class. I said, even if you miss the perfect square, it won't matter. The AC method will still take care of it. Now, when we look at this, we're thinking, well, that's great. We only have to worry about one. This is a repeated root, so to speak. So all we have to do is look at two cosine minus one. So equivalently, so in your notes, just write perfect square. So we use all the algebra that we've been working on when we did the algebraic equations and now uh, the logarithmic and exponential and the same with the trig. So this just means that two cosine theta minus one equals zero. Well, let's factor it. That's just zero factor law. So we get two cosine theta minus one half equals zero. So now when we look at this, we're thinking, okay, well, this is never zero, but this is. So by zero product, this just says cosine theta equals one half. Now, again, very simple. Basically what we do is we reduce the equation to real simple factors. Again, I think I will avoid a lot of the unfortunate numbers so you can get used to this technique. Um, you, you can still have some nightmarish type equations that can require more numerical methods, especially that we saw with polynomials. You know, that, that's always the case. But I want you to actually learn this technique so they'll be focused on problems that will actually be solvable. And then of course, as you uh, need uh, more numerical methods, uh, you can use Newton's method from calculus one and even some numerical methods that you would learn in a numerical methods class at the university. So now we're thinking, okay, well, this is the inverse cosine and, and this answer, well, what do we, well, let's just think about it. Where's the inverse cosine of, of X lib? That lives between zero and pi. But now of course, that's a positive number. So we know this is gonna be in the first quadrant. So equivalently, theta, is the inverse cosine of one half. Well, that's our friend in the first quadrant, that's pi over three. But remember, that's good, that's positive, that's in zero to two pi, so we're saying this is in zero to two pi, so we don't have to change it up like we did with the sine, and so the other solution will be two pi minus pi over three. I'm just using another letter instead of using subscripts, maybe so I don't have to go back and mark in subscripts. Sometimes I do that, sometimes I just change the letter. So this will be a six minus a pi. So this will be a five pi over three. So now, again, we have, because we have the perfect square, we don't end up with four solutions. So we have this and this. So these are the solutions in zero to two pi. That is, this is this, these are the solutions we find in one period. And so that's all that we have. And then we extend them infinitely by adding two pi k. So now this means our solution set, we'll just start with pi over three plus two pi k and then five pi over three plus two pi k. Now, sometimes, when you're doing these problems, if they if the these uh, uh, numbers here actually differ by like multiples of pi, you can consolidate them a lot of times to make the uh, the statement of the solution simpler. That's always something that can happen with trig equations. So don't be don't be fearful of that. Um, you're thinking if your if your solution set is redundant, it's better that it be redundant than not uh, sufficient. 
Okay, so you don't want to have gaps in it, but but sometimes you get overzealous and you 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 have a redundancy in your uh, solution. But but I'll I'll show you about that if that comes up. It's not something to worry about. Better to have too much, knowing that you've got everything there. So again, a basic equation using some algebra. Now let's look at it just, I've got here some, just some equations that have to do with some other trig functions that we haven't really talked about. Let's just do one of these. This, we're starting out with some real easy ones just to get everybody's feet wet, so to speak. So let's look at, um, oh, here's a good one. Say we had something like tangent two theta. So when you look at tangent two theta, you're saying, well, you're dividing the period by uh, what? You're dividing the period by uh, two. So the standard period of pi becomes pi over two. So, so is that gonna change the quality of the solution? Yes, but in a very simple way. And I'll show you how to do that. So this is what we call, like, like we say, the, the cosine of the double angle. This is the tangent of the double angle. And then you're thinking, do we write the tangent of the double angle? Well, that would be overkill. That is too complicated. We just keep this simple as, as it is and, and note that on occasion, we may have to use more powerful identities, but this is certainly not the case where that would be true. So we'll just, again, this is good to go, isn't it? This is just zero product. So if and only if tangent two theta equals one. Now remember, the inverse tangent function lives with just like the uh, inverse sine, but we don't include the endpoints, negative pi over two to pi over two. And of course, since this is positive, this is gonna be between zero and pi over two in the first quadrant. So you think with, with tangent, where, where are we really interested? Usually it's convenient just to look in zero to pi. Okay, and then we can affect the division by two once we extend. So let's just go ahead and look in zero to pi, but we're like, okay, we don't need Professor Ron's lemma because in zero to pi, the tangent function is one to one. Now you're thinking, what about secant and cosecant? Well, that's just cosine and sine. So that's Professor Ron's lemma again. So there's nothing different there. And of course, cotangent is one to one on its period. So, so you don't need a Professor Ron's lemma for those functions. Secant and cosecant are covered by cosine and sine. So, so everything's good. So now when you look at this, you're saying, okay, what does this say? Two theta is equal to the inverse tangent of one. Well, life is good. That's, that's on the unit circle, that's uh, pi over four. So now you're thinking, uh, what, what do I do here? How do I, how do I negotiate that uh, uh, two theta? Since I've kind of let it ride with everything, I'm gonna show you a simple way to do this now. Now at this point, you can think, okay, well, since this divides the period by uh, two, I can do multiples of pi over two k. But here's an easy way to do it in a, in a more algebraic fashion. So we'll say then for all solutions, we'll have two theta equal pi over four plus pi k. So I'll give you the opportunity to go ahead and extend to all solutions. So if two pi is equal to four pi over four plus any integer multiple of pi, that's a solution. But what's theta? So then you can go ahead and divide. So what I can what I can uh, give you here as a solution technique is extend extend by pi k then divide by two or whatever the coefficient of the theta is. Maybe it's a three theta or a four theta, okay? So this is, this is a technique that might allow you a little less chance for error. Again, you can just do, you know, you can divide and do it that way, but this way 
This way, all the algebra is set up for you. So now we divide by two and we get theta equals pi over eight plus pi over two times k. And now when you look at this, there's your complete solution. So I think I've found that students have a little bit more success with the multiple angles if they treat this just like that's a plain theta. Run it through, go ahead and extend if you have to do Professor Ron's limb or anything like that, and then divide. Because if you don't, then, then you're gonna think, okay, well, I, I divided the period, but I didn't divide the actual solution. So this, this technique here will actually be easier. And so now when you write your, fill in your uh, blank here, you just have pi over eight plus pi over two K and you're done. Very easy, okay? So, so this technique will be good. You can, you can make variations on it, but I don't recommend it. You, you'll make errors. This way you'll get it correct. Now let's look at another one. Two sine squared theta equals two plus cosine two theta. And we want all solutions. So we want to say solve, just like we had this one, solve. So now when you look at this and you think about the equations we've done before, we it's like, we had one variable, like we had an X. We didn't have an X and a Y. So this is like having an X and a Y. We've got uh, sine squared and we have cosine of the double angle. And we're thinking, well, we can't really apply the algebra very well uh, with the different trig functions running around. So this is what I said before. Let me go back to the, uh, where did I set that? Oh yeah where I give you Professor Ron's lemma, algebra and identities. So now what we can do, we're thinking we've got a nice configuration for the uh, angle, the double angle of the cosine uh, here, or cosine of the double angle uh, using the identities from last class. So we can say, all right, and write everything in terms of sine. So over to the side, just remind yourself, cosine, two theta can be written as one minus two sine squared theta, the cosine of the double angle. And this is what we use to get the power reducing, remember? That's the power reducing. So we have two sine squared. So there's not, there's not just one way to do this, but this is certainly a way that's easy. So then we get two plus one minus two sine squared. So we replace this with this using the identities. So this is like an algebraic identity that we would use uh, like previously the perfect square, but this is directly tied into the characteristic of the cosine function and its addition formula. So now we can put everything on one side. This is easy, this is the square root property. So this is gonna give us four copies of sine squared And then here, notice we've got a, a equal three. So we're like, oh, wow, very good. So let's, let's go ahead and factor it. Put everything on one side if you want. So we have four sine squared theta minus three equals zero. So we wanna write this as a leading coefficient one. So let's divide by four. So we get sine squared theta minus three fourths equals zero. So that's a, that's a difference of two squares. If we think of this as uh, the square root of two, square root of three over two as the square root of that. So if and only if we have sine theta minus root three over two, sine theta plus root three over two equals zero. So this is where, I mean, if you think about this and, and what did, let me look up here. WebAssign actually gave us a little break here. Not that it matters. They say solve, we can do all the solutions, but they just say solve in zero to two pi. 
looking at my notes here, they say solve in zero to two pi. So you can easily extend all of them if you want, but now that means that we have to look at this and this. So if and only if by zero product, we have sine theta equals square root three over two. Again, a very simple equation using the unit circle or sine theta equals the negative square root three over two. Okay, so we can use Professor Ron's lemma for both of these and be done with it. So now same song and dance theta will be the inverse sine of the square root of three over two. And of course, the inverse sine of the square root three over two, that's gonna be pi over three. That is the 60 degree angle. So we have pi over three. And that's in the upper arc. So the other solution will be pi minus pi over three, which is two pi over three. So that's Professor Ron's lemma. This is in the upper arc. So we subtract solution from pi to get second solution. Okay, so we're done with that. Now here, this says theta. You can use the same variables because this is a separate uh, equation, separate uh, part of this particular problem. So no, no, no harm here. So we have the inverse sine of the negative square root of three over two. Of course, the inverse sine is odd, so we can factor. So we get negative inverse sine of root three over two. And that'll just give us the negative of this, negative pi over three. But of course, we expect this, this is in the fourth quadrant, but that's not, not in a positive realm. So this will be congruent to negative pi over three plus two pi. So when we add, that'll be a six minus a one. So this is five pi over three. So again, this, this gives us lower arc. So that's one solution, lower arc. So now with the lower arc, we do three pi minus this. So the second solution by Professor Ron's lemma will be three pi minus five pi over three. So that'll be a three times a three, that's a nine. Nine minus five is four. Now, of course, if you look, if you look at all of these, these differ, these differ by pi and these differ by pi. So if we wanted to consolidate, we could, we could write all solutions. I'll do both for you just to give you that idea that I was telling you about before. But now in zero to two pi, we have four solutions. That is, that's it. Professor Ron's lemma exhausts zero to two pi. So for this answer here, this implies, this list them, this, let me put boxes around all of them. So this will be pi over three, two pi over three, all exact computation. Use your pies, no decimals. Don't, don't do that to me. You, you're, you're better than that now five pi over three. So if we solve in zero to two pi, Professor Ron's lemma gives us everything. And in a lot of cases, ladies and gentlemen, you can sit here and kind of look at the unit circle and figure out what they are, but we just want to make sure we cover everything. Now, just as an, an additional uh, part or additional bonus to this problem, if you were asked to find all solutions, you could actually consolidate. So notice, notice here, that these differ by pi and these two differ by pi. So if I add two pi k to each of these, that's gonna be redundant. I don't need to do that. I can just add, I can just add a multiple of pi to this to get that. And I can add a multiple of pi to this to get that. So if I just add multiples of pi to pi over three and to two pi over three, that'll cover everything. And that, that kicks, that gives you everything. So we can say uh, since four pi over three, here, let me so you can see that four pi over three minus pi over three equals pi and five pi over three minus two pi over three equals pi. We can write all solutions 
all solutions as by just adding multiples of pi. So we can say in this case, we'll have pi over three plus pi k and then two pi over three plus pi k. So of course, if you add, if you add pi, you get that one. If you add pi here, you get that one and then everything else. So, so it, it's not wrong to have redundancy in your solution, but it's a little bit inefficient. So if you were gonna do all solutions, you just notice that, that okay, well, you know, it's not like the period changed for the function. It's just that I don't want redundancy in my answer. So if you, if you do all solutions, you could write it this way. So this is, it's kind of nice to just do zero to two pi, kind of, kind of see what's going on. See, see if anything differs by a convenient multiple of pi and then work out the problem that way. So that's just a little extra, just to remind you of what I was talking about before. Okay, let's look at another example. This next one, again, I've got several here. This next one actually uh, is, is an interesting problem because it utilizes uh, one of our new identities. Before, before I do that, I wanna get, I wanna look at an example that'll give us a little bit more practice with some, some of the trig identities. Let's see here. Mm. Yeah, that one will work. I'll do this one next. That'll uh, remind us of some of our uh, rational zeros there. But let me go ahead and do this one. So example, and in this case, and this is another consolidation problem. Solve, solve. And I'll just put in parentheses, all solutions. So now let's look at this, sine theta plus sine three theta equals zero. And you're thinking with a problem like this, it's like, okay, well, you know, you could give me an example where I get to use that special lemma, you know, with the a squared plus b squared square root, that's Pythagorean. But here we've got two copies of sine. So I thought this would be a good opportunity to use one of our identities. So notice when we rewrote the product to sum to get sum to product, we've got some nice relationships here. So, so we're thinking when we solve equations, this may not be as useful for doing integration problems, but now we have this identity that is, Recall, and this is what you need to have on your note cards. Uh, you don't want to have to derive everything, but, but again, have them available to go. We have sine alpha plus sine beta will be two. Then we get the average alpha plus beta over two, and then cosine alpha minus beta over two. Now, these look so complicated, but all we did, remember, is we just made the simple change of variables just to run them backwards. That way that these arguments were simple and the more complicated arguments we would find on the right-hand side. But it's still, it's kind of like the A minus B, A plus B with the uh, uh, sum to product. Same, same deal here. Here, the sums, we want to look simple. Okay, so when we look at this, we're thinking, okay, well, let's just make a substitution. Notice here, alpha will just be replaced with theta and beta will be replaced with three theta. So we'll just use the identity here. So if and only if we got a two there, not that it matters. So we have two sine, I'll just go ahead and write this out, theta plus three theta over two. You could do this as a little sidebar and then fill them in, but I'll just go ahead and do this. And then we have theta minus three theta over two. 
this equals zero, if and only if. Now the two just goes away. You can just divide by two and it's gone. So we have sine. Now we have four theta divided by two. So that's two theta. And then we have cosine of negative two theta divided by two. I'll go ahead and write this out. Remember the last time I just said, oh, well, you know, the cosine's odd, so the negative absorbs. So we get sine two theta cosine theta equals zero. Now, when you look at this, you can think you can think of this problem uh, as a multiple angle. You're thinking, well, I could use the sine of the double angle and get another copy of sine, but then that would give me a cosine squared. Then I've got the square root deal going on, you know, and so that probably wouldn't make that wouldn't make the problem any easier. So the fact of the matter is, is that we know how to deal with the double angle. If this is just a zero product. We're fine. So don't, you know, don't go and say, oh, well, I've got different sine and different cosine different terms, don't worry about it, they're in product and we can deal with each of them separately because we have the techniques. So we can say, this is good, or this is easy, er. Again, using the sum to product and then the two just gets wished to the cornfield because two is never zero, so we just divide by two. So equivalently, we get to use our double angle uh, technique again. So we have sine two theta, equals zero. These are so easy, you have to think about it. And then we have cosine theta equals zero. So these are these are axial, so to speak. So now when, and, and we're gonna think of zero to two pi. When is, when is uh, sine zero, sine of anything zero? That means that the input either has to be zero or pi. So we have two theta, equals zero. I'll just go ahead and write these down and we have two theta equals pi. Now, when you when you think about this and, and you think about maybe something kind of simple here, can can we actually consolidate this so it's really, really simple? So so we're thinking, okay, well, zero and pi, zero and pi. Well, can I just replace that with maybe pi k? So now I'll just say consolidate because we're lazy. So this basically just says two theta would have to be some multiple of pi. Even in, in, even in zero to pi, that means that we would have either zero or one, and then we're just kind of extending it automatically. So if you're here or if you're over here, just multiples of pi, you're gonna get sine zero because you're on the x-axis. So you're thinking, yeah, life is good. So now this just says pi or theta is equal to pi over two times k. That was easy. See, when, when they're on the axis, x or y axis, there's nothing to do. And we don't wanna like beat this to death where we're like just doing the same thing over and over. So so, so go ahead and do the extension knowing that you can consolidate these, get the, all the solutions and then divide by two here. So we're done. So this is like zero plus uh, uh, pi k and then we divide by two. So this, this covers this. So this is, this is a technique of consolidation. So you would need to practice this. This is not something you're gonna get right away. This requires practice. Now. Help me out here. What's going on here? So when we think of we think of cosine being zero, we think we're on the y-axis. So we get what pi over two and three pi over two. Hmm. So if we're thinking of all of them, we're thinking of what? We're thinking of uh, odd multiples of pi over two. Hmm. Okay. So we'll say theta. We'll just go ahead and consolidate because we're lazy. This will be odd multiples of pi over two. So we'll just say 2k plus one. All right. And so when we think about zero to two pi, that would mean a k 
equal to zero for pi over two and k equal to one for three pi over two down here. So, so it's kind of like this. When it's easy, it's easy. If you make these problems harder than they are, you will come to grief. Maybe you have already come to grief. That's my favorite phrase from Rayleigh's abstract algebra. I think I've told some of you this. He, he makes a comment in his very famous book that's been written to many editions. He says, if you do not practice the theorem proofs and definitions, you will come to grief. He says, you may have already come to grief and everybody just chuckles, yeah, we have come to grief. So, so the idea is that when you're here or here, that is you've got what? Uh, zero comma one, and you've got zero comma negative one, or you're here, one zero, negative one zero. So we know the sine is zero here, multiples of pi, so that's what gives us this. And we know that the cosine is zero, at least with the visual, uh, when we have multi odd multiples of pi over two. So we're thinking we're good to go. Now this one, this one's done. Now look, what does this say? This gives all multiples. This gives all odd multiples. So when we consolidate, we just get multiples of pi over two so that we're done. So pi over two K and we're done. This just focuses on the odd ones. This focuses on all of them. So this is a subset of this. So just this covers everything. So that's a consolidation problem. I don't want you to look at this and feel like you have to do work and work and work and work. Look at this as easy. Professor Ron's lemma deals with the, the angles that live in the quadrants. But when you're on the axes, the life is, is good. The life is easy. So practice the consolidation in a very straightforward manner and just say, I've got two theta here. So that means two theta must be a multiple of pi over k for this sign to be zero. Then that gives me pi over two uh, times k when I divide by two. So this technique is easier to remember. And this one doesn't have anything except recognizing the unit circle. So when we solve trig equations, you don't turn your brain off. What do you do? Always, uh, my, my unit circle always gets buried I don't, let's see, between the, let's see, what did I do with it? I don't even know if I can find it anymore. Is that it? Let's see, I'll, I'll, I'll find it. I think I've just buried it. I think I put it under the, here we go. There it is. When you think about the unit circle, always go back to this room and remind yourself how far you've come. But everything starts here, okay? The arithmetic, everything we do is based on this object, okay? So, you know, think, make life easy on you. Always carry this around. This is like your identity. This is, this is your, your key to success with trigonometry. Okay, so that was easy. Now let's look at another example. I've got one right here. So just think about, think about how in a calculus problem, this would be an easy integral. A sum is easy to integrate. So this would not be something you're going to be doing in calculus unless maybe you're looking at some continuity argument. So, so we find when we solve equations and things, we, we kind of go in opposite directions. If we have products in, in uh, calculus, those are difficult antiderivatives. So we want to write the products as, as sums, like you'll see in your web assignment to make simple, simple uh, antiderivatives like we did with the power reducing. Okay, now what I wanna do is look at an example that has to do with a little bit more algebra. The, the interesting thing is when you think about this problem, the first thing you're gonna do is think rational zeros theorem. So I actually pulled this from your web assignment. Let me take this out. So this will be, well, let me, let me get the paper clip off of this so we can actually see it.
So here we've got the following, solve, and I want you to find all solutions. So solve, and I'll write all solutions. So what we're seeing here is that bunch of identities and lots of techniques for solving equations. So we have three tangent cubed minus, this, you're gonna see this is easy, but I, I think this is a nifty problem. Three tangent cubed minus three tangent squared minus tangent theta plus one. Now, when you, look, when you look at this problem and you think about it, we wanna find all solutions. First, you're thinking this is just a, a college algebra problem where we can think we've replaced uh, x with tangent uh, theta. So we've got, a, we've got a polynomial in tangent, okay? When you take calculus, you, you, you write your transcendental functions in terms of x's, so your calculator will work. So this is kind of going backwards. But notice here that this is the oldest trick in the book. If you sum these coefficients, you get zero. So if we were to place, uh, replace uh, the tangent theta with one, you're thinking that's a, that's, an, that's a solution. So you know pi over four is a solution from the outset. Uh, so that was easy, but how does that help us? Well, uh, synthetic division, so let's do it. Again, I'll be good to you, WebAssign will be good to you. We won't you know, push you off into the deep end. That's not the point here. This is the, how you use techniques you already know. So we have three and then, then apply some new ones to make you better. So we know one is a zero if we replace tangent theta with one. So bring the three down, three times one is three plus uh, negative three is zero. And the zero times one is zero plus negative one is negative one. And then of course, negative one times one is positive one plus one, excuse me, negative one plus one is zero. We know we're gonna get a zero here because one is a zero. So that, that's good, we, we, we like that. So now reduced, so this implies, let me just put this over here. I don't wanna take my equation here. So from this, this implies or equivalently, we have tangent theta minus one. So if one is a zero, tangent theta minus one is a what? Factor, factor theorem. And then we have the reduced, so this will be uh, uh, three tangent squared minus one. So when you look at this problem, this is like x minus one times three x squared minus one, just like we did with uh, rational zeros theorem. Now, I'm not a big, a huge believer that we need to do all this review of college algebra. Uh, I, I know that most people don't agree with Professor Ron with that because I think it gets a little bit too much and maybe you get bored by it, but I guess what I'm seeing is that it's good for you to review it, otherwise it would make this class uh, uh, too difficult. So, so maybe that's a good thing. Now, when you look at this, we have zero product, but now this is a difference of, of squares. So let's go ahead and divide by three. So equivalently, we have tangent theta minus one, and we'll just pull the three out and we'll get tangent uh, theta squared minus one third. So now we have a difference of two squares and then the three just goes away, divide by three. So this is kind of fun, isn't it? So tangent theta minus one, and then we get tangent theta minus one over root three, just write one third as a, as a square root. And then we have tangent theta plus one over root three. So I guess the thing is the simple equations just use Professor Ron's lemma and they after a while get really boring. So when we spice it up a little, so we use one of our new identities, 
you know, practice using the new lemma, you know, that we did at the beginning of class to use that to solve some equations. You can make them up. You can you can use the examples we've done in done in class. And so now this reminds us of when we were doing the theory of equations with the polynomials. So now zero product. So if and only if tangent theta equals one or tangent theta equals one over root three or tangent theta equals negative one over root three. Now, the, the beauty here is that we can extend these all by pi k because this is not a multiple angle. We don't have to worry about that and, and, and know that in the uh, period zero to pi, uh, we have one to one. So the beauty, the beauty of the tangent function is that we take that one to one branch. And so that makes the tangent function easy to work with. Cosine and sine are difficult. I mean, I'm not saying that they're unfortunately difficult, but, but we really have to work a lot harder with sine and cosine. And of course, if you have secants and cosecants, you just think of those as sines and cosines and use Professor Ron's lemma. But tangent is our friend. Okay, so now we can look at this and say, well, this theta is equal to inverse tangent of one. That means just theta is pi over four, and we can extend that. We already knew that from the very beginning. Now here, think about this, theta, this is gonna be in the first quadrant, right? Inverse tangent of one over root three. So now what we want is we want the, uh, the one half to be up top, that is, and, and then the root three over two to be downstairs. So that corresponds to pi over six in our unit circle. So very simple. Now, theta here is inverse tangent of negative one over root three. So this is the same thing. So this is gonna be the negative of this guy. The inverse tangent is uh, odd. So we factor the negative. So this gives us negative pi over six. But again, it, and at this point, we're not using Professor Ron's lemma, but if you think about it, if you want everything to look kind of nice, you can add a multiple of pi to put it into the positive realm. Don't have to do it because we don't have a Professor Ron's lemma. But if you want to just make your answers look a little bit better, just add pi. So this will be congruent to pi minus pi over six because we have the period of the tangent function, which would just be five pi over six. So that would be that would be a nicer uh, way to start, even though it doesn't make it correct, uh, any, any more correct. Maybe it's not a bad idea to think of it this way, because if you don't do it for sine and cosine and you use uh, Professor Ron's lemma, it'll obviously be incorrect. Um, <laughs> I, I like it when you all send me web assigned messages. I'm not sure what I'm doing here. I thought I did it right. And I said, you know, it looks like you're on the right track, but try this. I appreciate those emails. I appreciate those web assigned messages because it tells me what you're working on. It tells me what you've done so I can negotiate it. If you just say, I'm confused, ladies and gentlemen, that does not help me. You have to convince me that you've worked on the problem and say, well, I tried this, but I didn't get there. I'll say, okay, take that idea and let's work with that. So that helps me to help you. Uh, there's certain words in the English language that are too general. And when they're too general, they, I, I can't help you. I always need specifics, so I appreciate that. So now let's extend by what pi k. So all solutions will be pi over four. Notice these are, are don't differ. Uh, I mean, if we look at this, uh, this doesn't dip, differ by pi or anything, so we can't consolidate in a, in a nice elegant way. So don't worry about it. So we get pi k. Now let's just do the, do the, uh, let's just do the, uh, the commas and that way we'll keep it simple. Pi over six plus pi k and then five pi over six plus pi k. Now, of course, I normally put the union symbols, but I'm kind of stopping that just to kind of give you how you're gonna do this in WebAssign. You're gonna have your little box here 
and you're going to put your answers separated by commas, extended, especially when you need all solutions. Now, now of course, if this problem said solve in zero to pi, you'd have this, this, and this. So we can say in, and sometimes they ask you to list some solutions in a particular interval. So don't be surprised if you do that and use the common denominators to make it more user friendly. So we can say in zero to pi, we get what? Pi over four, just pick these off. Pi over six and uh, five pi over six. So when it comes to solving equations, when it comes to solving these types of problems, we just use everything that we have. Nothing, nothing in particular. Now, um, there was an example, let's see here. Let me just give you an example that utilizes uh, uh, a simple technique that we can knock out here. Uh, let's see, that's what we've already done. Uh, let me, okay. Let me just give you one to, to think about and then we can uh, uh, finish it up. Here, we wanna use that lemma. I keep always going back to the lemma. Lemma's a favorite of Professor Reynolds. So here's, a, here's an interesting equation. I, I wrote in my notes here a good example. So if we look at this, in this case, we just want to solve all solutions. All solutions. And we have tangent theta plus one equals secant theta. Now, when, when you do an example like this, you're thinking, okay, well, can I, can I rewrite this into something simpler? And this is, this is my choice here. And then of course, we're gonna have to be careful that we haven't introduced extraneous solutions. So this is kind of like a squaring technique. So what I'm gonna think of is that if I can multiply everything by cosine, I can get the lemma. So here's my technique, here's one way to do it. So uh, multiply, I do this in my smart pen videos too multiply by, uh, in this case, uh, cosine theta. So when we do that, we get tangent theta times cosine theta plus cosine theta equals secant theta times cosine theta. Now, when you do this, notice that the cosine absorbs the cosine in the denominator here. This gives us sine theta. And then of course, cosine theta. So you're seeing the lemma right here. And then of course, this is one. So when you look, when you look at this, you're thinking, okay, well, this is kind of, this, this side here is the lemma and there's the one over here. So what am I gonna do with this? So, so in this case, we're thinking use lemma, use lemma. So we have A, equals one, B equals one. So we've got what? A squared plus B squared is one plus one, which is two. And then we have a uh, tangent of five is one. If and only if phi is inverse tangent of one, which is pi over four. So, so this is, this is a nice example of the lemma. If you actually notice this, instead of having to square everything and making it utterly too difficult. So this is what I do when I try to figure out ways to teach you that will help you get better. So now we'll, do, we'll consolidate this. So we get what the square root of two, square root of a squared plus b squared, sine of theta plus pi over four. So that's the lemma right there. Remember, we have square root of a squared plus b squared times sine of whatever x is, theta plus pi. So we're done. But now this is one trig function equals a number. So now let's divide. So sine theta plus pi over four equals one over root two. Well, this is nice because that's on the unit circle. 
So equivalently, <clears throat> we can use Professor Ron's lemma, theta plus pi over four equals inverse sine of one over root two. Well, this is in the first quadrant <clears throat> because this is, a, this is a positive number. So this equals what? Pi over four. Mm -hmm. Again, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> when you think about this and you think about what we're doing, it it's it's actually quite interesting because we have to use Professor Ron's lemma, but we have to be careful of the fact that we multiplied here. So so far so good. So now when we when we when we look at this and say, okay, well theta, the pi over four is absorbed, so theta would just be equal to zero. So if we look for all solutions, this is just theta equal two pi k. So we just add two pi k to zero or we get two pi k. So, so we're done with that. This is all solutions there. Now by Professor Ron's lemma, are we gonna get any more? Well, by Professor Ron's lemma, this is in the upper arc. So we need to subtract. So the other solution, so we'll just write this as uh, theta, or alpha, let me write it this way. Alpha will now be pi, so where are we, right here. So this is one, I'll just call this the first solution. And then let's see, what do we have later? Let me, let me write this correctly. Notice, notice the way we've done this, and, and this is important, and I need to make sure that my logic is correct. When we actually solve for this, we have theta plus pi over four equals pi over four, and that will give us the value for the, for the theta here. Now, when we look at this, we're thinking, okay, uh, what's the other solution relative to this? Because that's the, the argument. So when we write second solution, we have to be careful. And we think about it this way in the sense that we have alpha plus pi over four will now be equal to, in this case, pi minus pi over four. That's the logic that I was about to mow over here. So we have alpha plus pi over four and this is three pi over four. So alpha equals three pi over four minus pi over four, which is pi over two, two pi over four. And now this is where, this is where we have an issue because pi over two here is undefined. That is tangent of pi over two, that's a vertical asymptote. So note here, logic of Professor Ron's lemma. So this has to be discarded, discard. So we'll say original equation, original equation, undefined. So this logic is really important here. If I go this, go this route, I have to stick to it. And so this implies that all we got was that, two pi k. So, this, this is one where you might look at this, ladies and gentlemen, and say, well, I'll just square everything out and use the Pythagorean identities. But this is an excellent opportunity to use the lemma and then Professor Ron's lemma. Now, this is a hard equation. This is difficult. This is advanced. I, I didn't do this because I thought it would be simple. This is advanced. So, so I want you to study this and master this technique with utilizing the lemma and then the logic here. This is a very, very nice problem. And again, if you can do this, you're good to go. So let me just kind of uh, uh, summarize everything. We move from the unit circle to inverse trig, to right triangles, to triangle theorems, more identities, more identities, more identities, and then trig equations. So 
all the trig that I've taught you is more than you will ever need for calculus. If you, if you have a basic fundamental mastery of this, then you can navigate calculus with ease. But if you have any deficiencies anywhere, go back and clean that up. Go work on the arithmetic, work on Professor Ron's lemma. So this is gonna give you a foundation for the calculus. Now, some of you may go on and take Fourier analysis with partial differential equations, and you'll learn some more trig identities, but you'll still be using the foundation. So, so yay, we're done with the trigonometry. And so after this, we're gonna start the uh, conic section and, and get into the uh, last uh, uh, stretch of this course. So I appreciate your attendance today. Uh, maybe I'll see some of you at the office hours. We'll do more equations. I appreciate your effort. Uh, everybody have a great day. Next week is going to be cold again. So Professor Ron's happy for that. I'm, I'm tired of the hot weather. So everybody have a great day. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks, guys. You all have a good day.